what's up, everybody? It is uh, good to see you back here for the Alone series, uh, Alone Week 4 here, and uh, I'm just excited to be a part of this. Uh, my name is uh, Jeffrey Harris, and I am the uh, pastor of students and children at Parkway Baptist Church in Evans. Um, so a little bit about uh, me. I've been at the church as a member since 1996. Uh, so probably back when some of your parents were born, uh, that's when I started going to church here. I'm not as old as Shane. You guys remember Shane from last week? He was the guy that uh, did the talk from the airplane hangar. I uh, had like the um, had like the sprinkler system above his head. That's how they baptize people over there because uh, they have so many people getting saved. They just set the sprinklers off, uh, so they just you know sprinkle. Everybody gets sprinkled, um, and that's how they do it. I'm not as old as Mark either. The guy that did the, the talk before, uh, Shane, he was at a, at, a, at a TV studio. I don't know where he was. Uh, and, and I'm a little bit older than James. Um, and he did his talk from the Sistine Chapel. Uh, the, the really nice stained glass window behind him. Um, I was kind of jealous of his herringbone uh, Mr. T starter set that he had on. Um, but I'm a little bit older than him, and I'm not as old as those guys, okay? So I'm like in the middle of those guys. It's like a youth pastor sandwich, and I'm the, I'm the, I don't know. I am what I am. How about that? So here's a, a little bit of something. There's going to be a little bit of comedy here, um, but not a whole lot, because we're going to be talking about what it means to be alone with God. And one thing that I've noticed, and I don't know if you guys have noticed this either about, you know, COVID-19, um, there was a lot of time when we were alone. A lot of people felt like they were alone, like they'd been abandoned almost. But with that, kind of the gift of it was that the distractions just kind of went out the window, right? Like there weren't uh, the things that usually would like pull our attention. They were kind of gone there for a few months. Now, now I don't know about you, but I get distracted pretty easily. Okay. Um, so little story here. Um, I'm a dad. I've got a five-year-old son um, and we've got uh, one on the way. Uh, we're not sure if it's a boy or a girl yet. Uh, we call it, call it nugget uh, or nugget if it's a girl. And um, so we're excited about that. But car line is a thing. It is a reality now as a dad. Uh, I used to hear people talk about car line and I'd be like, that's not that, that doesn't sound that bad. Now that I'm a part of it, I realize car line is actually uh, pretty brutal. And so when you're in car line, what happens is, is that you stop for about five minutes while they're loading kids up in front of you. And then all those cars pull up and then you pull up and then you stop again. And if you're not paying attention, like I wasn't one day, you can almost coast into the bumper of the car in front of you, right? So being distracted is almost a, a dangerous thing in some situations. Being distracted in your walk with Jesus is a deadly thing. And Jesus, even when he was on earth, he had like a laser focus on the mission that God had sent him to accomplish. You know, when we think about Jesus, I don't know about you guys, I think about all the stories about Jesus feeding the 5,000, Jesus with his disciples teaching them, you know, like trying to get them through the thick skulls, like what he was there to do. But sometimes we kind of gloss over the times when Jesus would go off to how the, the New International Version says, lonely places, to be alone with God. And, and sometimes like that I, I see in, in scripture, like Luke chapter four, where Jesus is, is tempted by Satan. Now we tend to focus on him being tempted by Satan, but Jesus had gone into the wilderness to be alone because he was getting ready for his ministry on earth, his public ministry that lasted about three years. So he's getting ready for this major work and Jesus withdraws out into the wilderness, out into the desert to pray and be alone with the Father. And Satan takes that uh, time to his advantage and tries to tempt him. And it's interesting that Satan tempts Jesus with things that Jesus already 
has, you know? So, and then another thing, um, we see Jesus uh, in Mark chapter six, his disciples have gone and they've done this great work and Jesus tells them to withdraw from the people for a time of rest. Jesus grieved loss. He would go out uh, in um, Matthew chapter 14 after John the Baptist was executed. Uh, Jesus went out to grieve that loss, to process um, the loss of John the Baptist. And Jesus himself, his testimony about John the Baptist was there, there is no one greater, no man greater. Uh, born to woman that was greater than John the Baptist. So he grieved that loss. You know, to get ready for a major decision, Jesus goes in Luke chapter 6, before he chooses the disciples, he withdrew to a lonely place and prayed all night long. And then in a crisis moment in Luke chapter 22, we see uh, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's praying uh, because he knows what's getting ready to happen. This is just ahead of the crucifixion. Um, you know, we we read about how he's praying so intently and, and, the, and the pressure and, and the reality of what's getting ready to happen to him is pressing down on him so much that he literally dr drops of blood beat up on his forehead. He sweats drops of blood. So Jesus in this crisis moment is praying um, to the Father. Now, I don't know about you, but if we're Christians, if we're Christian, what that means is little Christ. It was a derogatory term when it first came out. It meant like they were making fun of people that were called Christians. But if, if you're a Christian, what that means is that you're supposed to act and be Jesus. Like what you do with your hands, what you say with your mouth, and what you think in your mind, all those things are supposed to be in line with how Jesus thought, spoke, and acted. So when I would go to a movie, I, I don't, you guys go to movies, okay? Uh, so I like movies. I grew up in the 80s, all right? 80s had the best movies, okay? Uh, we had, like, don't look any of these up, all right? But we had The Goonies. That was, like, one of the best movies of the 80s. Uh, we had this other movie called Big Trouble in Little China, had Kurt Russell in it um, before he was uh, super old and like destroying planets and Guardians of the Galaxy 2. Um, we had Indiana Jones. That was a great movie, all right? I remember going to see Indiana Jones when I was a little kid, okay? And Indiana Jones, he, he's got this hat. It's a fedora, and he's got this shirt, and it's like unbuttoned down to here, and he's got a bullwhip and a gun, and he's killing Nazis. And I thought that was awesome, all right? So I remember going to see Indiana Jones, and when I came out of the theater, I found like this, like, you guys know what pompous grass is, okay? And there was like this landscaping around the movie theater, and I grabbed this stem of pompous grass, and I acted like it was a whip, okay? And I was just running around trying to whip everything, like I'm trying to whip my dad. He didn't put up with that for very long. And I'm trying to whip the car, you know, the people walking by, just trying to whip them with this pompous grass, right? Because I was so influenced by the movie that I wanted to act out what I'd seen. And the point of this is when we fill our mind and our hearts with, that's going to spill out of us. So if you're filling your mind and your heart with a movie, this is going to come out of you naturally, Okay. And the Bible speaks very clearly about this. So Proverbs chapter 10, verse 11, it says this, The mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life, but the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23 says, Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. And then Jesus in Luke chapter 6, verse 45, he says, The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of his evil. For out of the abundance of his heart, out of the abundance of the heart, excuse me, his mouth speaks. So what does that mean? So here at Parkway, I'm actually recording this. This is where we meet for student ministry and kids ministry. And we call this the overflow room because back in the day, pre-COVID, when we could all meet together and sanctuary was always packed, 
This was like the overflow space for our sanctuary. That was the idea, all right? So we called this the overflow room. And that was how it got that name, but we kind of have taken it to this different place biblically because when we come in here, what we want to fill our hearts with, what we want to fill our minds with is Jesus so that when we get pressed, when we get crushed, like Paul talks about in Scripture, what oozes out of us, what comes out of our pores, what comes out of our mouths, what comes out of the work of our hands is Christ. But that doesn't happen if you're not spending time with God alone. If you're spending all your time alone surfing YouTube and TikTok videos, if you're spending all your time alone looking at things on the internet that you ought not be looking at, if you're spending all your time alone filling your mind with nonsense from Netflix, if you're spending all your time alone trying to win arguments with people that you've had broken, relationship with, with, broken relationships with at school, if you're spending all your time alone thinking about how you're going to get back at somebody or how you're going to win or how you're going to exceed, focusing on yourself and not focusing on him, when you're pressed, when you're crushed, what's going to ooze out of you is that nasty stuff. And that's when we act out. That's when we lash out. And sometimes we even double down on our sin. And our sin drives a wedge between us and God. But more, almost as important as that is, is this. God didn't save us just so that we can miss out on punishment for sin. God saved us for a good work. Check this out. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 20. Listen to this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself, and, listen to this, gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors of Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. So we do this thing here at Overflow um, where we talk about uh, Bible study is kind of like going to the gym, okay? And the first time, like I, I'm a member at a gym. I remember the first time I went to the gym. I know it, it's super hard to believe, but I go to the gym, okay? Like if I didn't go to the gym, it'd just be like Job of the Hut up here talking to you guys, all right? But because I go to the gym, I am what I am, all right? That's it. Now, when we talk about Bible study, though, like the gym, here it is. First time I went, somebody walked me around. They were like, okay, this is how you use uh, the Smith machine. This is how you use the rowing machine. This is how you use um, whatever, right? This is how you do bench press. This is how you rack weight. This is... She showed me everything that I needed to know. And then I got to use my knowledge to work out on my own. Student, what your youth pastor desires for you is that we show you how to study God's word, how to be alone with God, and then you take that knowledge and you apply it to your life and you do it yourself. The worst thing in the world that we can do, and listen, this is convicting to me, and I'm not throwing shade on any other youth pastor out there, but the worst thing that we can do as youth pastors is spoon feed you everything. Because when you get out into the world and you're alone and you get pressed, you're not going to know what to do. So when I look at this passage of scripture and I see words that are repeated, I see reconcile, reconciliation, I know that that's important, okay? Even a guy from Kentucky understands that when you start repeating a word over and over and over again, that that means something. So what does reconcile mean? It means that two things that are at odds are brought together. And that's what Jesus did for us on the cross, 
Martin Luther called it the great exchange. Jesus takes his righteousness and gives it to us and he grabs our filthiness, our sin, our shame and puts it on himself. And when he dies on the cross, it's finished forever for all for good. And now we don't live underneath that weight if we are Christians, if we follow Christ as the Lord of our lives, if we've surrendered to him, we don't have that weight of a sin on us anymore. And God looks at us and he says, well done, good and faithful servant. We live in right relationship with God. Not only do we live in right relationship with God, but right here Paul is saying that we are God's agents to take his good news to people who are still dead in their trespasses and sins and bring them to be the agents of reconciliation, to take that ministry out to those people, to let them know that Jesus loves them, that he died for them and that he rose again conquering Satan, sin, death, and hell forever and ever so that we could be in right relationship with God and spend eternity with him in heaven. And I was reminded of something. I was hanging out with Shane a couple of days ago. And we do, um, we do at FCA Chapel at Grovetown High School. So if you're at Grovetown High School, um, and you want to be involved in that, we meet in the, the gym uh, every Wednesday. Get there at 7 o'clock, I'll give you a donut. Shane said something to me. It was really interesting. He said, you know, um, when I go to camp, this is Shane talking, when I go to camp and I've got my guys that are hanging out with me, they start to act like me. Uh, they start to talk like me. They start to do the things that I do. Um, and being around Jesus, being alone, with God is the same way. When you spend time with the Lord, when you're in the word, when you're praying, when you're worshiping, when you're alone with him, you begin to act not like him, but you begin to reflect him to a world that desperately needs to know who he is. You know, maybe you're in your youth room tonight and you're like, you're like so many of us, right? You grew up in church. You know all the church words. You know all the church, like, you know, things that you're supposed to do. You take off your hat when you go into the sanctuary. You say, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. Maybe you've even been baptized. But, but you know that you're not where you need to be. You know that you haven't surrendered yourself to Christ. Man, my prayer for you tonight is that you would do that. Go find your youth pastor. Do it right now. Don't wait for the end of this video. Do it right now. Go find your youth pastor. Go find your small group leader. Go find an adult that you trust and tell them that tonight you've decided that you're going to follow Jesus and that you want to be the minister of reconciliation for the world. Maybe you're here and you know that you've followed Jesus, but you've kind of fallen away. Man, Jesus is waiting with open arms. Remember, that sin has been taken care of. You're already forgiven of it. Just repent and turn back toward him. That's my prayer for you guys tonight. Y'all, nothing, nothing, nothing is more important than your standing with God. Have you surrendered your life to Christ? My prayer for you guys tonight Surrender to Jesus. Follow him. God, thank you for this time. God, thank you for this opportunity. God, I pray a uh, special blessing over the students that are watching this video. Uh, God, for their youth pastors, God, I pray that you would send your Holy Spirit uh, to fill their hearts to overflowing with love, compassion, grace, and mercy for their students, for the families, for the homes. God, for everyone who hears this word. God, for the things that were of me, I hope they're quickly forgotten, but God, for the word that was imparted, that came from you, God, I pray that your word would not return void, but you would use it to accomplish what you set it out to do. Jesus, I love you. I thank you for the cross and salvation, and I thank you for this opportunity, and I ask this grace over these students, these student pastors and their churches in your name. Amen.